all worldly religions for certain. They are they are behind the scenes of power in religion as much as they are behind the scenes of power in government. And this is what religionists fail to understand. What what I find is going on, Sethicus, is everybody forms their own little hovels, their own little groupings, and they believe that their worldview is perfectly safe and sanitized and uncorrupted. And it's like, well, I have my little belief and worldview and system that I adhere to, and it's untouched by this corruption, and it's, they're not controlling it behind the scenes. In other words, everybody else's religion is what is damaged, but, but my religion is perfectly fine, and it's, it reflects the truth, and it's uncorrupted. And it's like I see this in the alleged freedom community as much as I do in political groups like radical political groups. I see this as much in the freedom and anarchist community as you do in the religious community. You know, it's it, no one seems to be insulated from this mind control effect of I'm going to have my religion and it's unadulterated and un uncorrupted and untouched by this, uh, you know, influence. And but everybody else's is wrong. And uh, the, uh, it, it all comes down to one overarching thing is that they do not understand how this interconnected cabal, this network of sorcerers, if you will, because for lack of a better term, that is what they are. They are empl employing the art and science of being able to manipulate and influence the way an entire society thinks and sees all sorts of issues and they do that with ancient psychology see the when I have discussions with people in let's say the anarchist community or just maybe a concerned citizens group that meets in the city as part of a meetup group okay and I attempt to explain to them you have not looked far enough into what is really taking place in the whole power structure you have your view of it you you have your perspective of it your take on it based on the amount of knowledge and the perspective that you have thus far been able to see but just because you've only been able to to, to see that much through your research and study does not mean that it is not a much larger picture it is not a much larger study to make okay and you, i often find that what everybody wants to do is leave, leave it at their perception, not walk through the door into further realms of knowledge because they're comfortable with their perceptual aspect of it. They're comfortable with, well, I've understood up to this point, and that's what I'm com where I'm comfortable going. It's like starting to make a hike or climb up a mountain or a hill, and you're saying, well, this, is, this far and no further, and I'm going to set up my tent and camp here, and I'm not going any further down the path or any higher up the mountain. And that's all fear-driven consciousness. In one form or another, these people are still in a pure consciousness of fear, and they're in a consciousness of uh, disempowered thinking, because they think if they acknowledge that this is something much larger and much more sinister than what they think that it is, what they currently, where their current mindset allows them to accept that is going on in, in the power structure. That, that means we won't be able to do anything about it. It's too big. It's too powerful. Okay? But this is the exact kind of defeatist thinking that is not going to get us anywhere. We have to acknowledge just how bad the situation is. This is, this is part of... De being able to develop a an acceptable solution to any given problem first and foremost involves the confrontation of the reality of the problem hmm. this is the first overarching that nat natural law principle everything is mind the universe is mental if you don't get down to the understanding of this at a mental level you are never going to be able to affect the solution in the domain of physical worldly manifestation because the domain of physically physical worldly manifestation inevitably follows what comes in the mind and this the herein lies the the ultimate problem in all of these groups of people that i'm talking about in all of these persuasions and all of these factions if you will all trying to look at their different per perspective and pieces of the puzzle and see it from from their little slice and sliver of of reality and perception there's one overarching commonality overwhelming ignorance 
not enough knowledge take in they haven't taken in enough knowledge to form an accurate understanding and an accurate worldview of what is really taking place. They have not done that homework, certainly not to any extent effectively enough and on a wide enough scale. And I hear it over and over again. I'm, I, throughout the conversation today, Seth, because I would love to tell you just some anecdotes. I, I just want to tell you the kind of dynamics that I always run into because I'm a very acute observer of where people's mindset is at. So, you know, I kind of, I, 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 when I'm out in public, I'm usually a per, in a pretty calm, relaxed demeanor, you know, and people take it often as, well, he's not really interested or paying attention to what's going on with this person or that person, but I take it all in. Mm -hmm. I observe things quietly and just see where people are at, okay? I don't need to, you know, uh, try to make any kind of a big deal of it because I see what I see, I perceive it accurately, and I look at where people's mindset is at. This is what I do every time I go into any kind of a public space, is just go into observation mode and listen, hear what they're saying, <laughs> hear what the people are saying, and then recognize where the total inadequacies and deficiencies of their knowledge base is at. And I'm very unfortunately, never disappointed about uh, regarding the level of ignorance that always comes back. It, it's shocking to me. It's saddening. When I recognize how much knowledge has been placed out into the world for the consideration and consumption of the average human being, and then when I go out into public or into group, any kind of a group dynamic with other people, and I to talk with them and gauge what they know. I recognize the ignorance is so overarchingly colossal that we have made as a species, in my estimation, such little progress when it comes to real knowledge, when it comes to deep knowledge and understanding, especially knowledge of fundamental philosophical principles fundamental axioms of philosophy that have to be understood and built upon in order to build anything that's really going to serve what we say we want for ourselves as a species, okay? And the colossal ignorance regarding the real power structure behind the scene and the clinging, the, the desperate clinging to the dead corpses that are the existing institutions and existing religious thought systems and dead science as well. You know, I could get into all of this, but it, what, what I see is this absolute clinging for dear life to a dead corpse. And that dead corpse is all of the institutions and thought forms and uh, r absolutely nonsensical ideologies that people have stayed firmly and rigidly entrenched to because of their calcified egos. They will not relinquish the, 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 the stranglehold that they have on these dead corpse ideologies. Right absolutely do not do anything to progress for one instance or, or, or in any way whatsoever what they say they want for themselves. And I'll just, just give you, I want to give you a brief example because this really leads to the understanding of how people don't understand how this cabal of ancient sorcerers who employ mind control. This is all about mind control and steering whole civilizations in one direction that they can take almost so complete control of the mental processes of an entire people and steer them in one direction that they want them to go. That's how powerful they are and that's how powerful their influence is. And yet you don't have people even talking about this social engineering dynamic. Right. Most people won't even bring up the term let alone bring up the term mind control, let alone bring up the term sorcery, okay? They're, 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 this is one of the overarching examples of colossal ignorance that I'm talking about. People still don't even understand what the occult is. They don't even understand that it's ancient shadow psychology. If we want to really talk about what real occultism is, 
It is delving deep down into the human subconscious mind to understand the hidden motivations and the hidden psychological framework of almost all human beings, where our traumas are at, where our uh, m m true motivations lie, okay? You know, how we actually really see ourselves and the reality that we inhabit. Most people are loath to do this work. They don't want any part of any kind of introspective work like that. They're always looking to the external, to the external, to the external. And that is because they, as a whole, these people are psychological infants who have not done one minute, one minute of introspective personal developmental work upon themselves. They, again, want someone else to do the cleanup work. They just want to talk about how can we rearrange all this furniture in the room, but ultimately it's still all the same furniture in the room, okay? You haven't really made any changes to the underlying infrastructure of the house. You're just rearranging items in the room, and that means the conditions aren't really changing, okay? You're, you're doing the same thing over and over again in slightly different ways, and you're just maybe, you know, looking at it from a different perspective and saying, oh, well, this has changed, so therefore it must be a little bit better. No, it's another form of the same control. It's another form of the same ignorance, mm -hmm. okay? But they're not making any real progress. You know, there's all of these dialectics in place, these either or, you know, choose one hand or the other, but both of them are going to hit your jaw and knock you unconscious, Okay, you know, but but people will make those those simple dialectical choices because what is the alternative? Well, the alternative is doing real spiritual work upon yourself such that you change the framework of your underlying thoughts and even your subconscious behavioral patterns such that you're not going to be manipulated or influenced by these false dichotomies, by these false dialectical choices. But people are, would, would basically, because they're so psychologically immature and they're like psychological infants, you give them the choice. Do you want to take one of these little simple choices over here that, that pr proposes a reductionist worldview and an oversimplified worldview? But, but you, you, we'll give you the illusion that you're making that choice for yourself, okay? And you're a big boy and you can choose between these things. To do this work, it has to be a labor of love of truth because it's not a labor of love for human beings, okay? I, I make no uh, illusions regarding that. And I tell people, honestly, I don't do this for human beings. Quite frankly, I don't like human beings in the condition that they are in and continue to dwell in enough to want to do this for them. I don't do this for people. I do this because it's the right thing to do. I am not serving people. I'm serving the truth. That's what my purpose in life is. I've discovered my mission, and I'm on point with it. And that's what I'm going to continue to do. Whether people accept what you and I are saying about how they have to change themselves to really get out of the mind control dynamic that's going on in the world and help take back their true natural rights and inherent rights to, to be free individuals, to be sovereign individuals on this planet, whether they do that or not is their work to do that they are going to either fulfill or not fulfill. Okay, and they're going to be held to account for that, as everyone is. You're going to have to live with that and go on and move forward with that level of disappointment in yourself when you know you had the opportunity to do the right thing, and yet for out of fear, you chose to just try to remain as comfortable as possible. And that's where most people are at. The vast majority of the world is in that psychological space, and there's, there's all kinds of justifications and excuses for it. Endless. There's an endless list. You have to get freed up spiritually, ultimately, before you can get freed up mentally. If you don't, if you don't free the, 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 the spirit of yourself and get into the spirit of truth, Okay, which is, this is, this is internal work. This is internal emotional alchemy that most people never do to come in touch with who are you? Mm. What, what is really going on deeply down inside within you to do that shadow work? What would be a practical approach for developing your shadow? Well, that's a good one. Let's, let's do a little review of Jungian psychology. The first thing is, if you want to know about this, the proper source is Carl Jung's Collected Works, Volume 9, uh, vo Volume 9, and there's two 
parts to Volume 9, A and B, published as separate texts. And Volume 9 is called Archetypes of the Collective Unconscious. And vo the other one is called uh, um, Ion. But in Archetypes of the Collective Unconscious, there's a good discussion of the persona and the shadow. And, and a persona is the face that you show to the world when you're trying to uh, pretend and to convince yourself and others that you're I would say harmless, but we could say a good person. But a good person isn't harmless. A good person is capable of... Well, maybe a good person is capable of anything, but is willing to hold that in abeyance. That's the persona. And the persona is the mask that you wear, and that's what persona means, is the mask that you wear to convince yourself and the world that you're not a terrible monster, so that when you look at yourself in the mirror, you don't have to run away screaming. You know, and you might think, well, that's a bit of an overstatement, but Jung was very interested in phenomena such as, um, say, psychological, the psychological phenomena that would characterize the actions of someone who might be an Auschwitz camp guard, for example. And, uh, you know, that's a pretty monstrous form of behavior. And the thing about Auschwitz camp guards is that there's no reason to assume, really, that they were much different than normal people. Now, there would have been exceptions, obviously, but, and what that means is that perhaps you too could be an Auschwitz camp guard and perhaps you would even derive some enjoyment out of it and you might think not, but you shouldn't think not so quickly. And what that also implies is that if you could see what that meant when you looked in the mirror and looked at yourself, you might run away screaming because you'd have a revelation of just exactly what the human being is capable of. And that's a very unpleasant revelation and also one of the things that stops people from being enlightened because that revelation of the evil of the self is part of the journey to enlightenment and an early part. Now the shadow would be all the parts of the personality that the persona rejects and that might be the aggressive elements, certainly the that's the case with the, for people who are hyper agreeable. And now you can tell I think one of the best, there's two pathways to the development of the shadow and they're tightly allied with one another. Um, the fundamental pathway is truth and that's to face the bitter truth about yourself and you observe yourself and what you're actually like. You got to pay attention as if you don't know yourself, as if you might harbor hidden devils and then maybe they'll emerge. So practical approach for developing your shadow fundamentally is radical honesty and Jung said that you know, a genuine moral effort was a good substitute for psychotherapy.